بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس ویلکم ٹو دس سیشن آف ٹیکسچوئل اسٹڈی آف دا قرآن ٹوڈے ان شاء اللہ وی ول بگن دی اسٹڈی آف سورہ عال عمران وچ از دا تھرڈ سورہ آف دا قرآن لٹل اباؤٹ دی انٹروڈکشن ٹو دس سورہ سو ان آر پریویس سورہ وی جسٹ فنشڈ لاسٹ ویک یو ووڈ ہیو ابزرو دیٹ بیسکلی دا فرسٹ پارٹ اور دا فرسٹ ہاف آف دیٹ سورہ ڈیلز ود دی چارج شیٹ which the Qur'an has imposed or has presented before the Jews of its times and has said that how repeatedly they have floundered and violated the covenant of God. And various acts of breach have been brought before them. And near the middle of the surah, you will find that the Qur'an has said that now because of these crimes, they are deposed of this position and a new ummah by the name of Ishmaelites or the Banu Ismail or the Bani Ismail, they are now Repla- they, are, they will replace them, uh, the Israelites, and now it is their duty to do exactly what the Israelites were supposed to do. And the duty that was imposed on the Israelites was, of course, to bear witness to the religion of truth to the other people of the world. Now, because they have not been able to do that for a very long period of time, we know ever since Abraham, uh, right up to Jesus, who was the last of the Israelite prophets, there is a long period of uh, approximately 2,000 years in which various prophets of God came and uh, it was of course uh, something that really happened in the times of Moses uh, uh, when the Israelites were constituted in the form of an organized uh, nation and un- from Moses right up to Jesus we find, uh, may peace be upon them, we find that the Israelites uh, continued to, uh, to commit themselves to the covenant of God and then the very next moment they would breach it by various acts of uh, violation. So uh, this is how Surah Bakra has been structured that we have finished uh, studying in our previous sessions. So in the first half we find the crimes of the Israelites being presented before them and then near the, uh, near the half of that Surah we find the a new Ummah being constituted, the Ishmaelites and then for the rest of the Surah you will find directives being given to this new Ummah, the Ishmaelites. Uh, regarding some of the uh, some of the uh, important areas that they have to cover, and these areas of, clo- of course included the Sharia, like the Sharia of Qisas, the Sharia of the, of uh, in, uh, in in the initial directive of inheritance, of course, was given also in that case, and then various other directives related to, for example, uh, divorce related to jihad, and also related to uh, to various issues pertaining to women. So once this surah ended, and now we find the second surah, uh, Surah Al-Imran, which is the counterpart of this surah. So remember, when we were discussing the Farahi approach of understanding the Quran, we had also discussed that this Quran has been divided into seven chapters, and the chapters have been divided such that the surahs in these chapters, they occur in pairs. So Surah Al-Imran is the pair of Surah Baqarah. And one thing that we will see Uh, this is very common between the, between the two surahs, is the name of uh, both surahs. So the name of both surahs is basically Alif Lam Mim. We have discussed this earlier on as well, that these abbreviated letters or the Huruf al Muqatta'at as they are called, they are the names of the respective surahs. And so therefore you find that uh, the same surah, I mean the two surahs being named with the same uh, noun, telling us that there is a similarity in their topics. So the similarity that you will now see as we study Surah Al-Imran is that on precisely the same principle as in Surah Baqarah in which the charge sheet is presented before the Israelites, on a parallel basis you will find that this time in Surah Al-Imran the charge sheet is presented against the Christians or the followers of Jesus who were initially called the Nazarenes because we know that Jesus belonged to Nazareth and uh, that is why they were called Nazarenes and it was much later that the name Christian was coined for them. In fact, this is something that they coined for themselves. So the, uh, these Nazarenes, they were also similarly guilty of some of the uh, breaches that the Jews were earlier on. And their charge sheet is presented in particular in this surah, which is Surah Al-Imran. So you can see the similarity between the two surahs. The first surah, which is Surah Baqarah, uh, it presents the charge sheet against the Jews. And in Surah Al-Imran, the same charge sheet or a similar charge sheet is presented against the Christians. Uh, another very important uh, feature of similarity that you will see is that uh, in this surah also you'll find that uh, the Muslims or the believers or the Ishmaelites, they are 
they are commissioned as a ummah, as a nation, and the Christians are deposed. And of course, because of the fact that the Quran does not regard the Nazarenes or the Christians to be an entirely separate sect from, the, from, from Jews, because basically, as we know from the Quran, uh, and we know from the Bible also that uh, Jesus was sent uh, as someone to complete the Torah. He was not meant in any way to abrogate the Torah. So this, the same Sharia of the Torah was meant for his followers as well. But in time, we know from history that this never happened. And very soon after his demise, uh, his followers, they changed and distorted many of his teachings. And in particular, Paul of Tarsus, we know him uh, as, as Paul of Tarsus or St. Paul. They also call him by this name. He actually abrogated the Sharia and he said that this is only meant for the Israelites and for the, for the Christians. The only thing that is required is that they believe in the crucifixion of Jesus, that they, he had actually sacrificed his, his uh, life uh, for the sins of humanity. And now if Christians only believe in this fact, then salvation is going to happen to them. So this is a little bit of an overview. Now, as far as the names of the surahs are concerned, I have also discussed this earlier when we were starting to study Surah Baqarah that the names, the way they are named, of course, we find a Quranic name and we find the Sahaba also giving their own name. So Surah Baqarah basically, or the word Baqarah, is the name given to the Surah by the Sahaba. The name which was given by the Almighty was Alif Lam Mim, and it was also very customary in the times of the Prophet and in those times to name a composition by more than one name. So it was, it was also called Alif Lam Mim, it is also called Baqarah. And the reason that it was called Baqarah, we all know, was because of the incident which is mentioned earlier in the surah. And that incident is just about uh, four or five verses. It occupies these four or five verses. The reason that the Sahaba would uh, call this surah as Surah Baqarah would be because this incident of Baqarah or the incident of cow uh, is mentioned in Surah Baqarah. And uh, the full name was, uh, the way they would call that surah would be a surah allati tuskaro fi hil Baqarah. Uh, which means a su that surah in which the incident of the cow has been mentioned. So this would be like a whole sentence. But during the period of some period of time, it was shortened to Surah Al-Baqarah. And once again, it refers to the fact that as far as the names of a surah are concerned, which the Sahaba kept, they do not in any way uh, reflect the whole topic of the surah or the subject matter of the surah. That is not the case. And this is a point that we have to understand because this is not what we do in our human plane. Uh, we as human beings, when we write books, when we write articles, when we write compositions, they generally reflect the subject matter of what is written. So whatever the title of the book that we would be writing would always reflect in general the subject matter or the content of the book. But this is not the case with, uh, the, the, with the Quran. Uh, we know that the nature of the names is such that any prominent uh, incident that would be recorded in that surah would ultimately come to be called, or that surah would become to be called by that name. So that is how Surah Baqarah was called as Baqarah, or Surah Baqarah, because the incident of the cow was mentioned. Now in Surah Ali Imran, again, because of the progeny of Imran is mentioned in, uh, in the initial part of the surah, we'll just go and study that. That is precisely why this surah is called Ali Imran. So all means progeny in Imran basically is the name of Hazrat Maryam's father. So Imran is the maternal grandfather of Jesus. He is the maternal grandfather of Jesus and it is after him or his progeny in fact that this surah is named. And again, once again, the reason for this naming is not that the whole surah deals with the progeny of Imran in any way. That is not uh, correct in any, by any means. Again, the same, uh, the same feature applies and that is that because uh, in the initial part of the surah we find the, f the progeny of Imran being discussed, we find the incident of Mary or Maryam being discussed and how she gave birth to Jesus and how he was given certain responsibilities. Because of this whole introduction, we find that the surah is called Ali Imran. So Ali Imran literally means the, the descendants of Imran, the progeny of Imran, or in other words, as I said, the descendants of the maternal grandfather of Jesus. Because Imran, in fact, his full name was Imran bin Matan. This is what we know from the Bible. His full name was Imran with Matan and that is how he was called. But it was shortened to Imran and of course that is how the surah came to be called because it, it discusses his progeny. 
So with this introduction, we will now uh, start to study this surah. And once again, with this uh, very important uh, note that when we study a surah, we need to understand that the surah has a very, very coherent relationship between each of its components. It's not a haphazardly arranged surah. These, each surah, generally, we know from the history of the Quran, it, uh, most of the surahs were revealed uh, either in one go or they were revealed such that uh, once that surah would be complete, only then the next surah would start. And also important uh, that we uh, must uh, note here is that within a chapter, within a chapter, so we discussed this earlier on that the Quran has seven chapters and each of these chapters has for its beginning always a Meccan surah. So it starts off with one or more than one, every chapter. So this is the feature of every chapter. Every chapter starts off with one or more than one Meccan surah and ends with one or more than one Madinan surah. And within a chapter, these these uh, surahs, they occur in pairs, except uh, there are certain exceptions, as we've just discussed earlier on as well, that Surah Fatiha is an exception, it does not have a pair. It is the only Meccan surah of the first chapter. And by the way, the first chapter starts with Surah Fatiha and ends on Surah Maida, which is the fifth surah. So the pairing, uh, the way this, this chapter is presented is that Surah Fatiha does not have a pair. It is a singular surah and it was revealed in Mecca. In fact, we've discussed this also, that it was the first revelation of the Quran. It formed the first revelation of the Quran. It was the first surah to be revealed. And then the pairing is such that the second and third surah, Surah Baqarah and Surah Al Imran, they are pairs. And then Surah Nisa, which is the fourth surah, and Surah Maida, which is the fifth surah, they are pairs. And we will discuss the nature of that pairing once we, inshallah, reach that spot. But for this, uh, we have to understand that the nature of this pairing between Surah Baqarah and Al Imran is that in Baqarah, we see the charge sheet of the Jews being presented to them, and in Surah Al Imran, the charge sheet of the Christians being presented to them. One important thing also that uh, we must keep in mind that within a chapter, within a chapter, the arrangement of the surahs is chronological, which means the surah which is placed first also was revealed first. In other words, Surah Baqarah was revealed before Surah Al Imran, and Surah Al Imran was revealed before Nisa, and Nisa was revealed before Maida. So, some of the important things that you might need to keep in mind one, that within a, within a chapter, these uh, surahs they occur in pairs. A chapter begins with a Meccan surah, one or more than one Meccan surah, and ends with one or more than one Madinan surah. Then, within a chapter, we have the arrangement of the surahs in such a way that the surah which is placed first was also revealed first, all, always. This is always the case. So, within, the, within one chapter, the sequence is always historical. It's always chronological, which means the surah which comes first was also revealed first. So now we start off uh, with the study of uh, Surah Al Imran, and uh, uh, we will begin with the first verses: Alif Lam Mim, Allahu La Ilaha Illahu Al Hayyul Qayyum, Nazzala Alayk Al Kitaba Bil Haq, Musaddiq Al Lima Bayn Yadayhi Wa Anzal Al Taurat Wa Al Injil, Min Qabl Huda Al Nas Wa Anzal Al Furqan. إن الذين كفروا بآيات الله لهم عذاب شديد والله عزيز زنتقام. So alif lam mim. This is surah alif lam mim. So basically, uh, what is being said here is that the title of the surah uh, is presented in the form of a title. However, it is actually in the form of a sentence. So basically, the the the, the part of that demonstrative pronoun is omitted, and it was it would go something like this: Hazihi alif lam mim or Hazihi. Surah to Alif Lam Mim, which means that this is the surah which is called Alif Lam Mim. And it is exactly the same in the case of Baqarah also. And that is also why we would find our earlier authorities referring to these two surahs as Alif Lam Mim Baqarah and Alif Lam Mim Al Imran, because the divine name of both surahs is Alif Lam Mim. So this is Surah Alif Lam Mim. God is the being besides whom there is no deity. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum, the living and the one who keeps everyone in existence. So, viewers, this is a phrase that you come across very commonly whenever uh, you talk about the religion that uh, is called Islam. And remember what the Quran has said that all religions, all divine religions, were Islam, and all prophets of God they always bought the same religion, and that is Islam. So, therefore, the very first thing which is taught in this religion is there is no, there is just one God, there is no other deity. And this is the biggest and the most potent 
message of the Quran. It tells us that we have been created by a single person, a single being, and he, his name is Allah. That is, Allah is his personal name. He has so many other attributes which are mentioned in the Quran. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, Al-Jabbar, Al-Quddus. So these are his names which are mentioned variously, but his, his personal name is Allah. And of course, uh, in English language, we call him God. In, in Hindi, we call him Ishwar or Khuda in Persian. So these are all the synonyms, synonyms of uh, the same name. So if you call him God, it's exactly the same as Allah. And one thing that we have to understand is that this slogan forms the basis of all monotheistic religions, that there is no God but God. Allahu la ilaha illahu. Allahu la ilaha illahu. That is what has been taught at the very beginning. And you can see how Surah Ali Imran starts off with this very important note. And the reason, of course, being that we know that the Nazarenes of those times, the Christians of the times of Prophet Muhammad, had gone far astray in the matter of monotheism. We know that monotheism is something that was taught by Jesus, that was taught by all prophets of God. But once Jesus passed away, somehow the Christians got entangled in this philosophy that they declared Jesus to be the Son of God, his manifestation in this, in this world, and they, uh, they regarded him to be divine and to be a deity. So because the charge sheet of the, these Nazarenes is to be presented, the very first sentence which starts off the surah has this very potent message that remember there is no God but God. You have, don't have the authority to make anyone God because God is what he is and what he has said about himself and uh, unless he declares anyone to have any such authority, we don't have this authority at all. So Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum, the living and who keeps everyone in existence. So al hayy and al qayyum, these are two separate words. Al hayy of course refers to the fact that he is the only living, he is the eternally living being. There was no one who, was lived, who lived before him and there, was, there will be no one who lived after him. So this is a concept of an eternal existence and to a human mind, this is a mind-boggling concept. We simply cannot imagine a person living forever. When there was nothing, he was there and when there will be nothing, he'll still be there. So this is a metaphysical, metaphysically it's difficult to imagine, but that is how we have to understand that basically God has, is the living and he's not just the living, he is also Al-Qayyum. He brings and keeps everyone in existence. So he exists and he's also the cause of other people existing. And then the real theme starts off, Nazzal alaykal kitab bil haq. After putting people through trials, he could not have become indifferent to their guidance. Therefore, he has revealed to you his book as the decisive truth in confirmation of the scriptures which are present prior to it. And earlier it was he who had revealed the Torah and the gospel. So you see, this is how the Quran connects itself to the earlier books of God. It tells everyone who is present there that it is not a new book. It is not sent in a way that it is the first book of its kind. No, it is a, uh, there is a series of books books that, was, that were revealed by the Almighty. Earlier on, the Torah and the Injil, the Gospel were revealed and now in continuation of those scriptures, the Quran has been revealed. And of course, the important thing which is uh, said here is that which means that it, it has been revealed that uh, in confirmation of the scriptures which are present prior to it. So it's like confirming, confirming them and how does it confirm them? We have discussed this uh, phrase earlier on when we were studying Surah Baqarah because Musaddiq al-Lima bayna yadayhi is a very common phrase of the Quran. It actually refers to the fact that the Quran or, and the Prophet of, which, who brought the Quran, both of them have been discussed in the earlier scriptures. So when this book has arrived or it has come and the Prophet who has brought it, he has also arrived, then, he's, then this whole happening, this whole event is actually confirming the predictions that were found in the Torah and the, and the Gospel and the Injil, that there is going to be this book that will be coming and that will be the final book of God. So basically, when it's, it is said, Musaddiq al it, it actually means that it is confirming the prophecies about it that were found in the earlier books. And this also tells us, viewers, one, one very important thing, and that is that the Quran is not an unintroduced book. It is a known book. It is something that they were waiting for. It is something whose arrival had been predicted. So therefore, it is now said that this is the book that they were waiting for. So remember when we started off uh, studying Surah Baqarah, it started off with these words, Alif Lam Meem, Zalik Al-Kitab. 
So Zalik al-Kitab, of course, referring to the fact, this is that book of God which was promised to you, O Jews and Christians. This was the book that you were waiting for. So Zalik al-Kitab is basically the same thing which started off the Surah Baqarah and you have a very similar uh, note here in the beginning of Surah Ali Imran which tells us that this has come in confirmation of the previous scriptures. And it is God who revealed the Quran and it is God who revealed the previous books before it which are the Torah and the Injil. Min qablu wa hudal nas wa anzal al furqan and it is said that uh, and it was he who revealed the Torah and the gospel as guidance for people and now it is he alone who has revealed this furqan. These are the revelations of God and people who deliberately deny God's revelations shall be severely punished. So just one moment I'll spend on how our, our teacher Ustaz Ghamidi has, uh, has actually said that there is a sentence which is ellipsed, which is uh, suppressed in uh, on verse number two before this verse number two and it, he connects it by telling us that once the, uh, once the mention of the uh, Almighty had been made in the Quran that how he is the only deity and how he is the living and how he is the one who brings other people into existence. So his concern, his concern for his creatures is mentioned that he could not have left them alone after making them. He's, he's a deity, he's brought them into existence, but how could have he been unconcerned about their guidance? So precisely for this reason that they needed guidance, he he revealed his books. So that is how Ustaz Ghamidi has said that he, because of the fact that the Almighty has given us life and that life has to pass through various trials and in those trials and tribulations we might go astray, we might not be in a position to find the way. So the, the verse actually tells us and this part is suppressed that he could not have been unconcerned that after he has put mankind through various trials and he would sit back and not guide them. This would not happen. So that is why he has revealed his scriptures to guide them. So uh, just I wanted to explain this that this is how Ustaz has uh, made his point. Okay, now one important thing that you might also need to understand is uh, right after verse 3 when it is said min qablu wa hudal linnas min qablu hudal linnas wa anzal al-furqan so he has also once again suppressed Another sentence after the word Furqan and that is these are the revelations of God and people who deliberately deny God's revelations shall be severely punished. So the thing is that Inna kafaru bi ayatillahi lahum azabun shadeed. This was the sentence which has occurred right after Anzal al-Furqan that God has revealed the Furqan. So remember the word Furqan. Furqan is the, is the name of the Quran and it means a dis the distinguisher between right and wrong, the final authority between right and wrong, very similar to the word Mizan. So Furqan and Mizan are like two attributes of the Quran working in tandem. They are very similar to one another and the word Quran has not been used here. The Quran has been replaced by another name of, this, of, of, its, uh, of it, its own book and that is of course Al-Furqan. So Al-Furqan being that it is the book which distinguishes good from evil. And now that the Quran has been mentioned, you suddenly find uh, the whole flow of the Quran shifting uh, towards the fact that people who deny its revelations, uh, they shall be people who will be uh, faced with a lot of trials. So basically referring to the fact that the, the Torah, the Injil and the Quran, all three books have been revealed by God in one sequence, one after the other. And now people who are guilty of intentionally denying the revelations or the verses of these books they will be suffering a grievous punishment. And then it said, Wallahu Azizun Zun Tiqam, which means that he is revengeful for such people. He's mighty, Aziz is mighty and he's revengeful for such people. Zun Tiqam, a person who takes revenge from people. So the word revenge might strike us in a way that we might think that why is God being uh, attributed to be a revengeful God. So remember this uh, has a very special import here and that is revenge actually here means that he is a that is a, basically a facet of justice that uh, when we say that you'll be treated the way you treated others, you will, you will uh, basically whatever you cultivated, whatever you did sow or whatever you plow and whatever, so shall you reap, what the, whatever you shall plow, so shall you reap. So basically when you say, when we see that God has been regarded as revengeful, it basically reflects to his or has a reflection on his attribute of justice, that he is a person who is not going to let people go, he is going to take an account from them, he is going to put them through this process of retribution. 
So that is why this word has been used. And then uh, you can see that as far as the Quran is concerned, the next part is something which is also very, very important. It says, In Allaha la yakhfa alayhi shayun fil ardi wa la fis sama, huwa allazi yusavvirukum fil arham kayfa yasha, la ilaha illa huwa al azizul hakim. This is because nothing on the earth or in the sky is hidden from God. It is He who makes your faces in your mother's wombs as He pleases. There is no deity but Him. He is the mighty, the very wise one. So basically, Wallahu Azizun Zuntiqam, it is here that we find that the next sentence is basically giving the cause. It, it's explaining that how is it the, that God is mighty and how is it that He can take revenge, which means that He will implement His justice. It is said that the, he, the reason for this is that there is nothing on, in the earth or in the sky which is hidden from Him. So in other words, His feature of taking account, His feature of judging people, His feature of accountability has been bestowed, He has bestowed this feature on Himself because nothing is hidden from Him. Every single thing He can take account of. He can account for every single thing. Nothing, the smallest of things is not hidden from Him. So when there is nothing hidden from him, it is absolutely easy for him to take account of the deeds of people. So that is how these verses connect to one another. And one part of that is then, then actually delineated. And it says that It is he who makes your faces in your mother's wombs as he pleases. So not only does nothing remain hidden from him, at the same time, whatever he creates, which might not be before people before that creation is exposed. He is the person or he is the being who creates the way he would like to. There is no one who can have any impact on him or have any influence on him. So this word kaifa yasha, it occurs very commonly in the Quran. It, he, it actually points to the fact that he has this authority which is unchecked. No one can have an impact on his authority. He can do what he likes. So when he it is said when, what he, he would do what he likes, it doesn't mean that he will do something which is uh, against his wisdom. So his wisdom is always something which, which qualifies his will. That is a given. But the primary reason that this word is mentioned here is that no one can influence him. So you remember that, that in the, Arab, uh, the Arabian mythology of the idolaters, they would think that these angels are God's daughters. They, were God's, they would think that they are daughters of God and therefore they can influence his decision making. And it is here that the Quran repeatedly negates this view that he will do what he likes. There is no one which can influence him, who can influence him in any way. So this is basically the background. These angels, these deities which these idolaters think will, uh, will have their impression on him, no way. He will do what he likes and, and of course whatever he will do will be according to his wisdom. So, La ilaha illahu al azizul hakim. There is no deity but him. He is the mighty and the very wise one. And so again, this, this paragraph actually ends the way it began. And remember, the, the way the, this paragraph began was Allahu la ilaha illahu. And it ends in, on the, exactly the same words, la ilaha illahu. So there's only a small difference. Otherwise, the paragraph started off with the same note and it ended on the same note, which is a note of monotheism. So remember, the, the stone of monotheism, this topic of monotheism is something which pervades the Quran so much. And especially here, because the Nazarenes or the Christians had made a very, uh, very basic mistake in his uh, divine, in, in the divine nature of the Almighty by including uh, others in, in, in Godhead as well. And to be precise, we'll be discussing this as we go along in the Surah. The whole concept of Trinity was introduced by the Christians or the, by the Nazarenes of later times. And that is how the Quran has said that, no, you have to understand that it starts off with one God and you just cannot add anyone to his, his own divinity. So viewers, before we go on uh, to the next part, uh, if you have any questions uh, until what we have studied now, uh, please raise them. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that, Dr. Saleem. Uh, our first question is by Shabana Ansari. Shabana, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Dr. Saab, you said that Allah has his name, meaning his personal name. So, as you told me earlier, that the Ahl Arab has given the Allah to Allah. So, is this Allah has his personal name, so that they don't feel the same as the Ajnabiyyat when they are doing this book? So, you see, this is something which has existed ever since the Arabic language was there. 
in uh, Arabic language come, came later uh, to the Hebrew language. In the Hebrew language, of course, we had his own name, Elohim. Uh, but in, uh, as we entered the Arabic language or the various concepts which were found in the Arabic language, so the word Ilah was used for various deities, various all types of deities. But when you add the article Alif Lam to the word Ilah, it becomes Allah. So that is how it's like saying the God. So Ilah is God. But Allah is the God and he is the real God. So that is what is actually implied. And this word always existed in the Arabic language. And that is why when the Quran was revealed in Arabic and it, and it introduced uh, him as God or as the God, it was not something which they did not understand. Thank you for that, Dr. Salim. Uh, Siddiqa Sadiq, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. Siddiqa, are you there? Ji, I'm here. Uh, my question is related to the first verse of this uh, Surah Alif Lam Mim. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that a lot of the Surah names were, some of the Surah names were divinely revealed and then some were eventually given by the companions. So my question is, uh, how did uh, the Prophet instruct the companions where to place each verse without naming the chapters um, um, you know, uh, considering that the Quran was um, placed in order much later. So, so remember that uh, the way the Prophet would indicate to his companions to place uh, a particular surah, whenever these Ruful Mukhattaat would be present, he would refer to the divine name given. So remember out of 114 surahs, there are 29 surahs which begin with these uh, abbreviated letters. So. Uh, in that case, he would be just uh, calling out the name of that uh, of that particular surah in the form of these abbreviated letters, and also he would at times signal one extra word after that if there was a commonality between these ruful muqattat. So, as I said, at times he would just say alif lam mim al baqarah, or he would say alif lam mim al imran, and uh, some of the other names also. But he would actually remember this is something uh, also which relates to Quran's history that it was generally. Uh, when the surah was revealed, it is not that surahs were being revealed in parallel to one another. For example, Bakara and Al Imran were not being revealed uh, in, in the, at the same occasion or simultaneously as they say. So once Bakara was completed, then Al Imran started and so on and so forth. So the current surah that was being revealed was the one in which the Prophet would instruct his companions to write. Yes, when the Quran was rewritten near the end, when it was given a new sequence, it was on that occasion that at times the Prophet instructed his companions that to, at times he would place a Meccan uh, verse which was revealed in Mecca in a Madinan surah and vice versa. Uh, these are very, very few examples, but he did so. But by, by that time, near the end of his ministry, we find that these names had already become solidified, it ha had already become introduced and the Sahaba had already started to name them in such a way. So. During the revelation, he did not need to say anything because, uh, as I said, the only surah that would, would be revealed at that time was the one uh, that he would spoke of, uh, in that, uh, he would speak of in that, in that, on that uh, case. In, in the case of uh, that final revelation in which uh, that sequence was, was revised, it was here that he needed to change certain places and by that time that those names had become very common. Thank you so much. Uh, Shiraz Ahmed, it's your turn now. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Shazad bhai. Uh, Shazad bhai, so. Surah Bakra and Surah Imran both talk about the people of the book. And before Prophet Muhammad, since the time of Moses, for 19 centuries, you know, uh, the people of the book, they, they were in charge. They were the ummat e -Vasta. But Quran describes that, uh, and so does the Bible, that they were sort of rebellious right from the beginning, if, if I put it in simple terms. And it makes me wonder that God, chose an entire nation for the first time in the history of mankind instead of choosing individuals we, whom we call prophets. And mm -hmm. the nation that God chose were constantly rebellion. Uh, was mm -hmm. it due, due to the prayer of Abraham or he didn't have any better option? Why was that the case? Why he chose such people who were consistently rebellion for two millennium and ultimately this responsibility was shifted to their cousins? So you see, there are th things that we should uh, keep separate. One is the outcome of his choice and the other one was the reason for his choice. So these are two separate things. The outcome, of course, was that they, uh, they did not honor their covenant the way they should have. 
But the reason for this choice was that because Abraham had been promised that as far as he is concerned, he is going to be uh, appointed as the Imam. And when he said that, what about my followers? Then the Almighty said, those who will follow you the ways that you have uh, prescribed, they will also be uh, similarly regarded. So remember, this was basically that promise which God made with Abraham and his progeny. Now, that promise, of course, is, was something which was based on merit. And that merit is something that actually, I mean, it, it materialized. And when, the, when, the, when Abraham asked him, Kala min zurriyati, and the Almighty said, La yanalu ahdi zalimeen, that as far as your progeny is concerned, the wrongdoers among them will not have the same advantage as I'm, given, as I'm going to give you. So you see, this was a law, or this was a promise that was based on merit. And the time that they honored it, or during the time they honored it, they were given that superiority. And that during the time that they did not honor it, they were actually punished. But the thing is that the Almighty persisted with them for, for quite a long time, as you said, almost two, two millenniums. And the reason being that there were periods in which prophets of God were sent and it was still, they were still given a chance that perhaps they will mend their ways. And it does seem so that near the end of their own period, when Jesus was sent as the final uh, Israelite prophet, so remember he was given some, uh, I mean, some mind-boggling miracles, some, something which only God could have done. Only he does give life uh, when a person dies. So he was given that, uh, this, this uh, power to make people, uh, he could uh, make people live again. So over this whole stretch of 2000 years, it seems that the Almighty gave them as much time as they could have seen or they could have wanted to bend their ways. So it actually speaks of the magnanimity and the uh, and the way the Almighty deals with his people. And this is something very similar to you'll find in the, in the times of the Prophet himself. So remember the, the, uh, the Munafikun or the hypocrites, the amount of latitude they were given, they were not taken to task when they started to scandalize the lives of the Prophet, uh, Prophet's household. Instead of tightening the hypocrites, the Almighty tightened the wives of the Prophet and gave them some strict directives. Why? Because there was this still chance that amongst those Munafikun, there were people who might bend their ways. So on a very similar uh, basis, in the times of, uh, of the Israelites also, because there were times in which they honored their and their covenant, although, I mean, you'll find in the Torah there were few, but still this, it was a spark that they had. So I, it does seem that the Almighty wanted to give them sufficient time so that once they are deposed, then they have no choice. So remember, this, when this deposition occurred, the amount of humiliation that they would suffer till the day of judgment has also been mentioned in the Quran, and that is that they will never be able to rise and every time that they are able to do so, they will either be, as the Quran says, Illa bi habli min Allah, bi habli min al -nas. They would only be able to find refuge in certain parts of the time and then they will be kicked out from that place and till the day of judgment, they will be, they will be continuing to go from one place to another in this state of humiliation and subjugation. So the amount of punishment was also commensurate with the responsibility that they, that they actually uh, were given. But as I said, basically it is because of the fact that the Almighty gives out of His grace that time to every, every nation so that it, is, it becomes absolutely sure that now there is nothing left out of them. It, it seems to me that it is basically purely out of God's grace. Thank you for that, Dr. Saleem. Noshaba Vaseem, please ask your question. Sir, my question is regarding the name of the surah. How, like, Sahaba allowed to decide the name of the surah? Like, is, this right. is a book of Quran. So, what's the history or behind the reason? So, you see, uh, this was something which the Arabs, uh, it was a tradition amongst the Arabs. If you even look at them now, you'll find the same name being repeated. For example, Abdullah 1, Abdullah 2, Abdullah 3. Or Abdullah 4 or Abdul Rahman 1, Abdul Rahman 2. It's the same name and just you, you just change the uh, numbering after that. It is something very customary uh, amongst the Arabs and uh, uh, to call one composition by different names, even we, I mean, uh, out of our own affection, we keep many names of a, the same person. We have those, uh, we have a real name, we have pet names, we have uh, affectionate names, so to speak. So basically, this is how human mind works. So in the case of the Arabs, this was not exactly the way we have just seen that maybe the Sahaba gave an alternate name. That's not the case. You see, the Sahaba would say, a surah alati tuskaru fi al bakara. So this is the surah in which the incident of the cow has been mentioned. So whenever they would refer to, uh, for example, Surah Bakara, they would say, well, that surah in which the 
whole event of cow has been narrated. But the sentence got shortened. The full sentence was a surah allati tuzkaro fi hal bakara. Uh, that surah in which the incident of the cow has been mentioned. But as you see that uh, it often happens that we shorten a longish sentence and a surah allati tuzkaro fi hal bakara actually shortened itself to surah al bakara. So this, this of course was something that occurred after the Sahaba. So the Sahaba would name that surah after that incident. But people who came later on, they shortened that sentence further and ultimately it crystallized into a new name. And in the times of the Prophet as well, uh, I mean if, even today you'll, you'll, you'll find if you pick up the, for example, the Arabic Musaf, the Musaf that has been published by Saudi Arabia, you'll find, for example, Surah Bara and Surah Tawbah. I mean, we, in, our, in our subcontinent, we call this ninth Surah as Surah Tawbah, but in the Arab tradition, it is called as Bara. Similarly, you'll find the name Fussilat as uh, the name being uh, produce, uh, pronounced for the 40th Surah, but we call it Surah Mumin. So you see, these are the same names, as, I mean, the same Surahs which, which have been given different names. And this was something which was very acceptable. Uh, but the important thing that you must understand is that these names never reflect or seldom reflect the content of the surah. Thank, Thank you for that, Dr. Saleem. Sh uh, Shiraz Ahmed, please ask your question. Shiraz, my question is, again, related to the names of the surah based upon the answers you just gave a few minutes ago, right? So if I heard you correctly, and you earlier on, uh, you gave an answer, I assume that your answer was that the, all the verses of Surah Bakra revealed before Surah Ali Imran, so Prophet didn't need to specifically mention that which Surah, to which right. Surah these verses belong to. Mm -hmm. So, according to Mulana Madhudi, just one example, the verses related to interest, Sood, mm -hmm. that are part of mm -hmm. Surah Bakra, they were revealed right. in the in the ninth Hijri, right? So he can mm -hmm. be right, he can be wrong. That, that's not mm -hmm. the point. But is it a safe assumption to say that at any given point in time, the piecemeal way of revealing the verses were only related to one chapter, and once that chapter completed, right. only then God moved or God started revealing verses related to some other chapter? Do you understand what yes. my question? I understand. So you see, uh, this is there. There has to be some opposing evidence to this and otherwise this is what common sense says that when one thing is being started to be revealed why would something I mean additionally uh, happen like that and the reason which uh, you have given for example Ustaz Abulallah Madhudi and there are several other scholars as well who give this uh, I mean they, they tell us that well the surah was revealed at such and such a time and therefore it was a Meccan surah or a Madian surah you see there is a basic difference in their approach and in the, in the approach of the Farai scholars so they actually base the uh, revelation or the time period of their revelation on various ahadiths of Shana Nazul, which means occasion of revelation. And most, more often than not, if you look at these Shana Nazul verses, uh, uh, ahadiths, they are, I mean, they are not correctly reported from the Prophet. They are not very authentic. And even our scholars who speak about them, they tell us that as far as these Shana Nazul verses are concerned, they cannot be trusted. So basically what the Farai approach does is that it, it picks out those verses from within the text of the Quran and then it determines whether these they could have been revealed in Mecca or Medina. And, and that is a, a slightly a different topic. But to come back to what you have said, I mean, there has to be some, it is only because it is mentioned in certain narratives that different surahs would be revealed at different times and the Prophet would say, well, place this verse in that surah and this verse in that surah. Has this whole concept arisen that simultaneous revelation was going on? In the absence of that, if you, I mean, just look at how the scheme of things is and how well knitted these verses are, it is very, very, uh, I mean, you'll find that break to come only once that surah has finished being revealed. Otherwise, I mean, you need some counter evidence to tell us that, well, uh, similar surahs were being revealed at the same time or more than one surah was being revealed. We don't find any such uh, testimony from within the Quran. It is only because of certain ahadiths in which this incident has occurred or this report has been given does our mind go towards that. Otherwise, if you look at it uh, plainly, purely on the basis of an academic uh, stru uh, structural discussion on the Quran, you'll see that basically once the surah finishes, only then the next surah should have been revealed. Uh, okay. So, Shazadbi, uh, in the light of the description that you just gave, right? So, 
we know that the Quran is not in the same. Now I'm only talking about chapters, not the verses within the chapter, right? It's not in the same order in which it was revealed. It's Arzay Khira's Kirat, right? So right. let's assume Surah X was revealed. And at that time, uh, Sahaba only knew that the verses are related to this particular Surah. Once that chapter, that Surah finished, the very next verse that was revealed and Prophet communicated it to his community, the companions, he must have told them, hey, this new verse is not part of the ongoing surah. Now it's part of some new surah. And for that, don't you think logically he has to give some name to that surah? That, uh, uh, that hey, this verse is the first verse of the new surah that is God, that is that God is revealing to us now. Of course, I mean, that could have been any, any, any name. And that particular name does not need to be a name that, that the way we call names. So in the times of the Prophet, a whole sentence could be spoken very, 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 I mean, in, in a very similar style. I just said that uh, the Sahaba would say, okay, that surah in which the snakes are mentioned, that surah in which the staff of Moses is mentioned. So they would pick up one sentence. And similarly, the Prophet would also do that. He would say that, well, that surah in which such and such an incident has been quoted, please place this surah right there. So that is something that, of course, uh, is nothing that we can uh, in any way uh, crit uh, criticize. What I am saying is that parallel, parallel revelation of different surahs at the same time is a concept which is outside of the Quran, which is being given to us by certain narratives, uh, the way they have been reported, and most of them are not very uh, authentic. So if we just uh, subtract that concept and we concentrate on the text of the Quran, we'll find that because of the fact that these surahs, they depict the phases of preaching of Prophet Muhammad in every chapter. And when I talk, talk of chapter, I don't refer to the surah, I'm referring to the group. So if you look at Surah Fatiha and you look at Surah Maida, you'll see that there is an evolution of uh, the prophetic mission. But for example, there are surahs which, which begin with a certain thing, uh, which is historically always first. And for example, you'll find that Badr is always before Uhud and therefore the events of the Battle of Badr are recounted before the Battle of Uhud uh, in any, any other surah. So historically that thing is, is also followed because as I said that every chapter follows the prophetic preaching sequence. Thank you for that Dr. Salim. I have a question. So the deity mentioned in the beginning of the surah, uh, Al-Imran, how do we know it's angels and not just demigods that were made by the idolaters of that time? So, I mean, I, I don't preclude them. What I'm saying is that because the addresses uh, her at that time were, of course, uh, primarily the surah addresses the, uh, the Nazarenes, the Christians, they were not, I mean, they were not involved in any way in polytheism. They were more indulgent uh, uh, to, uh, towards uh, a, a deviant form of uh, monotheism, which is that they regarded God to be one, but at the same time they had this concept of Trinity. So basically what has been said is that this concept of Trinity, which is going to be discussed further down in the surah, uh, so that a prelude is given to that and the prelude is that God is one. What I was referring to when I was explaining the surah was that a similar thing was also found amongst the idolaters who were found in Mecca. So basically this is a Medinan surah. So in Mecca we've had uh, the idolaters and they regarded angels to be daughters of God. And uh, you'll find that mention uh, very copiously in their literature. But this doesn't mean that only angels were regarded to be deities or daughters of God. They were other deities as well. So are we to assume that angels at that time would uh, roam within like as humans do? Why were they even mentioned? Like You see, uh, if you read Surah Najm, uh, Surah Najm tells us that the uh, idolaters regarded these angels to be the daughters of God. So it explicitly tells us that they, they would regard uh, these angels to be daughters of God and that if the, you are going to please these daughters of God, then you'll, because these daughters have, are very favorite ones of God, so they will have an influence on his decisions and verdicts. So if you please these daughters, you can have a result of your own choice. So this was a mythology so that even existed. So it's, even if it's, it's just a mythology or it could be a, just a metaphysical concept also? No, it was a mythology. It was a mythology. It was something that they believed and uh, for, for quite a few number of years, I mean, s several hundred years before the Prophet, I mean, when as soon as idolatry had crept into them, which is, uh, we know that we know from history how it happened in Arabia and how idols started to be coming. And one time we had the whole Kaaba being populated with about 365 idols. But uh, that, that occurred slowly. But the idols you'll see were basically named 
after a deity who was supposed to be an angel and that angel would be regarded to be a daughter of God. So that is why the Quran on one occasion yeah. says that you recall you don't like girls for your own selves and you'll regard them to be God's daughters, to be deities. That is precisely why the Quran has said this. Thank you so much, Dr. Salim. Riaz Khan, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Sure. Asalaamu Alaikum, Doc. According to, uh, according to the uh, 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 Yusuf Estef, he, was con he is a convert from Christianity to Islam. Right. He was a, uh, and he's a well, well known sort of Muslim speaker now. Um, he says that the concept of uh, Son of God was brought in after the uh, Romans accepted Christianity. But it conflicts with the Quran when Quran was not, Quran had already been revealed 1400 years ago. But the Nicaea agreement or the acceptance of Roman was recent. So, how do we? sort of reconcile this? Well, I mean, this is something that uh, you have to ask him because he has given you this reasoning. As far as the Quran is concerned, we find that this is something that has occurred much before this uh, era it actually started. The word Ibn and the word Abun. Abun means father and Ibn means son. So in the Arabic language and in the Hebrew language in, in particular, the word for God and father was the same. Ab. And the word for son and servant or abd was the same. So the word abd would be Abdullah, the way we call it Abdullah, is, would, would not only mean the servant of God, would also mean the son of God. So son and servant were similar synonymous words and they had the same, I mean the same Arabic origin or the same Hebrew origin. Same was the case with the word ab. So abun was not only father, but it was also God. So on many occasions when the word father is used, in the Bible, even today, it's basically God because this is how divine languages evolved. That initially the same word was being used for, for two nouns. So the same noun for two entities. So that is how actually it happened that this, this word actually was something which was adopted and without realizing that there are instances in which God, whenever the word up is used, it, it cannot be used for the Father, it has to be used for God. And similarly, there are instances in which it can only be used for God and not for a father. But this thing got confused over a bit or a period of time. And of course, then there were other things also that were adopted. So that is how it actually evolved. And the Son of God, the whole concept was something that, uh, that entered much later. Uh, it was not something that Jesus ever preached. Uh, it was not something which were the initial Christians ever believed in. It was a much later tradition. But as far as this, uh, this uh, diversion or contradiction is concerned, I mean, you need to ask him because he's given this uh, historical timeline. As far as I understand the Quran, I think this, is, this occurred much earlier. Thank you for that, Dr. Salim. We have no more questions at this time. You can continue with the session. Okay, so we will now look at the remaining verses. So, huwa allazi anzala alaykal kitab minhu ayatum muhkamat hunna ummul kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat fa amma allazina fi kulubihim zayigh fa yattabi'una ma tashabaha min hubtiga alfitna wa abtiga ta'wili wa ma ya'lamu ta'wilahu illa Allah wa rasikhuna fil ilm yaquluna amanna bihi kullum min 'indi rabbina wa ma yazakkaru illa ulul albab It is he who has revealed to you this book, which has verses that are mohkam also, and they are the foundation of the book, and some others besides them that are mutashabihat as well. Then those whose hearts are perverted always go after the mutashabihat from among it in order to create dissension and in order to know their reality, even though no one except God knows their reality. On the other hand, those who are well grounded in, the knowledge, in this knowledge say, we believe in them, all this is from our Lord, and in reality only those whom God has blessed with intellect understand such things. So remember, uh, we were discussing this, that uh, this surah as it progresses, it will be dealing with some of the deviations and uh, misunderstandings of the Christians and the Nazarenes, and one of these, uh, or many of these uh, misunderstandings were based because of not understanding certain concepts that occurred not only in the Bible, but also in other divine scriptures. And that is that at times the hereafter and at times things which are not in the imagination of a human being 
they are related in our own language by giving them as examples or by comparing them to what we can today understand. So this comparison was something that was in front of us uh, or before the Almighty so that he could communicate certain realities. And this has become a very sore point, a thorning issue in the history of nations that when they uh, picked up certain, certain phrases from the Quran and of, of course from the Bible, for example, the hand of God or the countenance of God or the throne of God, <clears throat> similarly things that were uh, related to the hereafter, what exactly would be the canals of the hereafter or the streams of the hereafter or the paradise which has been portrayed. So they would pick these and then they would start questioning and they would go into the nitty gritties. So with this background, the Quran says that remember, if you look at the Quran, then there are certain verses which are the muhkam, which means that there is nothing that you cannot understand about their reality. You would absolutely perfectly understand them. But then there are other verses in which you will understand what the verse says, but you will not be able to understand that reality which that word actually denotes because the reality stands for something that you have not even seen as yet. You have not even seen as yet. So the word mutashabihat basically means things which are presented in the Quran as a comparison to the words that we already know about a reality that is going to exist in the hereafter. So the word fountain or the word stream or the word canal is the word is a word that I know. Similarly, the fruits of the hereafter are like there would be bananas or there will be mangoes or there will be pomegranates. All these fruits are mentioned, but they are mentioned in relation to our concept of what these are in our own world. But in the in the in, in the case of God, of course, when we reach that uh, with that plane, that plane of existence, they what they would actually denote would be something that is yet to be seen because we can only give name to something that we have only seen. So that is how the Almighty at times communicates certain realities which we have not been able to see by choosing words of our own language and likening them, comparing them to words which exist or sh should exist uh, in order to communicate a certain reality. So it is here that the Quran says that the verses, as far as the verses are concerned, they are muhkam and they are mutashabe. So most people, when they understand or they try to study this part of the Quran, they translate the word mutashabe uh, a little erroneously because the translation which is generally given is that there are certain verses in the Quran which are ambiguous. Ambiguous. Now, this is not what the Quran is saying. It is only saying that there are certain verses which are presented in comparison as an example. So tashabaha, mushabaha, as you can all see from its Arabic origin also, means things which are similar. So this is what the Quran is telling us. It is not telling us that there are certain ambiguous verses, certain verses that we cannot understand, as is the general concept. It is only telling us that its exact reality is something that will only be, will be known to us once we actually reach that place. The streams and the canals of paradise how actually they would be, would be something that would be known to us when we reach that place. So the Quran says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ As far as their reality is concerned, their exact reality is concerned, that is something that you will only be able to grasp once you see them. But when we say that there would be canals or there would be streams or there would be mountains or there would be clouds, etc., you get an idea of what it exactly would be. Or when you say, for example, the hand of God or the watch of God or the throne of God, uh, all this g d does convey certain things to us, but as we, as we know that the word might convey a concept, but the reality behind that concept would be something that would be revealed to us when we actually see that. So this is basically the background in which uh, this whole, these whole set of verses has been revealed because of the fact that the Nazarenes had gone very far in trying to determine the exact nature of the attributes of God and how uh, we would see him, how we would judge him, how we would face him, and they would like to go into those nitty gritties. The, 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 these starting of verses, which are a prelude to the chart sheet, which is to be standard to the Nazarenes, is very appropriate and very apt. That look, that there are certain concepts which are presented to you in the form of comparisons. So you'll be, you will understand what they mean, but don't ask about their reality, because you've not even seen them. So unless you see them, how can you know what they look like? So it is here that the Quran gives us this uh, very important uh, warning. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Only God knows their reality. It does not mean that only God knows uh, the way they have been presented. No, the reality is only known by, by God. 
and then what rasikhun fil ilm yaquluna amanna bihi now here the quran says that the right way of the people who are grounded in knowledge what is that that they say that well we believe in that i mean without questioning uh, the the necessary details without being uh, having this curiosity to ask god what exactly what do you mean by that they believe in that concept broadly because they know that they will only be able to understand that whole concept once they are able to see it at the moment they can only have a glimpse of it through comparison by comparing that concept to a similar concept that we know in our own language kullum min indi rabbina so these people who are well grounded in knowledge will say that everything is from god fama yazakkaru illa ulul albab and in reality only those whom god has blessed with intellect understand such things ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب ربنا انك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه ان الله لا يخلف الميعاد so they say lord do not cause our hearts to go astray after you have guided us and grant us mercy through your own grace without doubt you are the giver Lord you shall surely gather all the people for a day of presence that will indubitably come it is a fact that god does not break his promise promises so in continuation what which was what was said earlier on that these are people these rasikhun fil ilm these people who are well grounded in knowledge they do not insist and they do not go off go after uh, the reality or the ex- exact form of things that has been mentioned to them Uh, what they say is that god do not uh, con- contort our our guidance in no way please lead us astray so that we are in we start indulging in these nitty gritties we would like to broadly accept them as facts from you as the quran has said kull kullu min indi rabbina that all of them are from our lord and we would like you to bless us with your mercy because you are the one who is really giving and innaka jami'un nasi liyawmil la rayb fi you are the person who is going to gather all of us all people about on a in a day which about which there is no doubt and you are not going to break your promises in the lazina kafaru lan tughniya anhum amwaluhum wala auladuhum min allahi shay'a wa ulaika hum waqudun nar kadabi ali fir'aun wal lazina min qablihim kazzabu bi ayatina fa akhazahum allahu bi dhunubihim wallahu shadidul iqab the wealth and children of the believers sorry the wealth and children of the disbelievers of this book who have been conclusively communicated the truth will be of no avail to them before god and it is they who shall become the fuel of hell their matter is also similar to that of the pharaoh's people and those before them they denied our revelations so god sees them because of their sins and in reality god is stern in retribution so the the these verses they continue i mean once the prayer of the believers is mentioned once the prayer of the rasikhun fil ilm is mentioned the quran now says that in direct opposition to these people who would like to submit themselves to god who would find him themselves humble before god and ask for his guidance and ask for his mercy we have another group of people and they are the people who have intentionally denied the word of god or they have intentionally denied the truth and the quran says well there is no escape for them neither their wealth nor their children are ever going to be of any benefit for them so remember this tribal uh, in this tribal mentality that existed in arabia was something that would at times make people arrogant because in a tribe your own wealth your own associates your own tribesmen they were the biggest means of your support and their biggest means of your comfort and you would know that if it's, if someone if some calamity would strike you you'll have all these people helping you out but the quran says that this is not going to happen on the day of judgment if you have that tribal mentality you must come out of that because on the day of judgment people who have intentionally denied their wealth and their children the amwaluhum wala auladuhum neither their wealth nor their children are going to be of any help to them and they'll become the fuel of hell now an example is given kada bi ali fir'aun wal ladina min qablihum their matter is also similar to that of the pharaoh's people and those before them they denied our revelation so god sees them because of their sins and in reality god is stern in retribution so the example of the pharaoh and those who before them it is said that they are the same i mean they belong to the same lot kazabu bi ayatina they are the ones who intentionally denied our revelations and then fa akhazahum allah bi dhunubihim 
God actually sees them for their sins. And we, we know that in Arabia, people who were living there, they were fully aware of the history of their own prophets. So Moses, about Moses, we know that the Quran says that he was a prophet sent to the uh, Israelites uh, and he was someone who was very similar uh, in, in his uh, import and the guidance that he brought and the preaching, the way he did so, similar to the prophet himself, prophet Muhammad himself. So all these prophets of God, in particular the prophets of uh, Israelites and the prophet of the Israelites who was Moses, was someone who, were, who was who, about whom people were very familiar and they knew what happened with him, they, they knew what happened with his challenger, they knew what happened with Pharaoh. So therefore they are being told that nothing new is going to arise from this as well. If they were put to task, they were taken to task and they were put through these trials and they were punished, nothing different will come to you as well. So they were caught for their sins and you'll be caught for your sins. Wallahu shadidul liqab and God is stern in retribution. Here's one thing that I'd like to also point out here is that this very important theme of the Quran, especially you'll find pervading it, is that this very, very strong uh, message that God is going to take you to task, God is going to hold you accountable and God is stern in retribution, God is not going to let anyone go scot-free who deserves to be punished. This is a persistent message we get from the Quran. So remember, in the Quran, the, 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 the category of criminals which the Quran is, is, is actually dealing with is a very special category. And that is people who have intentionally denied, people who know the truth. I mean, they are not in, I mean, they are not in any confusion about the truth. They are not denying the truth because of any misinformation, not because of the fact that something has not reached them. They are fully aware and they still deny them. And this is the punishment of arrogance. So when you find this, this uh, uh, fury of God being unleashed in certain verses of the Quran, always remember that the, those verses are speaking of a special category. Not every cr criminal uh, that we find today belongs to that category. So people who have intentionally denied is a very special category. About them you'll find such harsh words as we have just seen and also such words as Khalidina fiha abada. They are going to stay there permanently, eternally damned in hell. So always think that this particular uh, uh, aspect of the Quran is not discussing every criminal. I mean, there are various criminals, there would be various criminals, there would be people who would not be up to the mark, they will be punished, they might be taken out of hell and of course given appropriate punishment. But the category that is being dealt here with the Quran are the ones who are found in the era of messengers of God and they are guilty of deliberate denial and it is on this deliberate denial that God becomes furious. He is very angry and I think this is something which we would understand. We too would become very angry with the person who knows the truth, who is absolutely convinced about it, but still emphasizes and stubbornly says that I will not accept it. So this is what I had to explain to you. Now, Look at the beautiful direct address. So at, at this time, previously the verses were being spaced out as indirectly being as a narration embedded in that dialogue. But today, I mean, as soon as you turn towards verse 12, it's like a direct, it's like a direct uh, address. And that is, Kul lil lazina kafaru sa tughlabuna wa tuhsharuna ila jahannam wa bi'sal mihad. Tell these disbelievers, soon you shall be vanquished similarly and after this driven towards hell and what an evil resting place it is. So Kul basically is addressing Prophet Muhammad. He's being told that tell these disbelievers that they shall be they shall be vanquished and they shall be driven to hell. And this, it is a very, very uh, evil resting place. And if you feel any doubt about in the statement of ours, then there is a great sign for you in the account of the two groups which faced each other. One group was of the believers fighting for the cause of God and the other of the disbelievers fighting for the cause of Satan. They in the battlefield of Badr were openly seeing the believers as twice their own number. In reality, God in this manner reinforces with his help whomsoever he pleases. Surely in this there is a great lesson for those who have vision. So 
like uh, like an example or something which is to be presented to substantiate a claim that has been made in a very similar way the next verses are basically presenting that example so when it is said that these disbelievers they shall be they shall be vanquished and they shall be driven towards hell now a whole picture is presented before them that this has something which has already started in the times of prophet in the times when he faced these disbelievers uh, first for the first time in open battle and that was the battle of badr so that is what is now being portrayed and because of the fact that the battle of badr has occupied in our history a very special significance because it was the first battle in which the whole might of the disbelievers were was totally i mean it it was there with its full might its full glamour and then it was its back was broken by, by people who were one third uh, their own number and they were totally routed and then the almighty is actually conveying to them that look if you want to know an example of how you would be dominated how you would be vanquished just look at what happened in the battle of badr when these very few people who were fighting for the cause of god to qatilu fi sabilillah but they were small in number and on the other hand we had a big very big uh, uh, battalion of army and they in and what we know from the quran also is that they kafiratun yarawnahum mislayhim ra'yal ain that they were actually thought that they are twice in number because of the fact that we know that in the battle of badr angels were also fighting alongside the believers and it does seem that they were being they fought in the form of humans and that is what these disbelievers saw so although they were just about 300 or 13 in number because of these angels fighting alongside uh, the believers uh, the disbelievers thought that they they are twice their own number and uh, i mean much more than they are actually seeing so this is what is being portrayed and this created that awe in them and they they, they lost that confidence that they have and they ultimately were routed and totally defeated in that battle and that was the first episode the first installment in which this uh, whole system was totally put to bay and it it crashed on its to, to ground it it was totally routed and the first installment was also instrumental in bringing down great names uh, so we know that abu lahab is the only person who survived this battle and that is only because he did not actually participate in the battle and he too died later on a very a very uh, a little little after the battle of badr by it he was uh, he was inflicted by a very very evil a uh, sickness and ailment and he died a very very uh, horrible death but the major part of uh, the arab leadership the, the quraish leadership was put to the sword and they were routed in the battle of badr so this was an example which the quran has given by telling them that soon this is going to happen to you and look this is the first installment that has come your way zuyyana lin nasi hubbu shahawati min an nisa'i wal banina wal qanatir al muqantarati min al zahab wal fizzati wal khayl al musawwamati wal an'ami wal hars zalika mata'u al hayat al dunya wallahu indahu husn al ma'ab for those who are deprived of this vision the lures of the world women and sons treasures of gold and silver marked horses cattle and plantations have been made very tempting all this is the provision of this life and a nice abode is only with god tell them shall i inform you so this is the next verse kul anabbiukum bi khairin min zalikum lil ladina taqaw inda rabbihim jannatun tajri min tahtiha al anhar khalidina fiha wa azwajun mutahhara wa ridwanun min allah shall i inform you what is better than these things for the god fearing there are orchards with their lord below which rivers will flow they will dwell in them forever and chest wives and most of all the pleasure of god fiha azwaju mutahara wa ridwanu min allah wallahu basirun bil ibad and god is watching these servants of his allazina yaquluna rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana dhunubana wa qina azab an-nar these who pray lord we have professed faith so forgive our sins and save us from the torment of the fire and who are these then they are now introduced as-sabirina wal-qani as-sabirina was-sadiqina wal-qanitina wal-munfiqina wal-mustaghfirina bil-ashhar these who are patient truthful obedient who spend in the way of god and who implore for forgiveness at the break of day so now the next verse is actually once again present that picture in which it is said that just as these people who are disbelievers who are going to suffer this this very very heinous fate opposite to them there are people who are also going to be blessed but 
Remember, it is also said that people who are deprived of this insight, this insight in which you are able to vision that you are going to be held accountable before God in the hereafter, this insight which makes you a person who submits to God. On the contrary, on the opposite side, the Almighty says that people who are deprived of this vision, to them, the lures of this world and the lures which the Arabs were actually so fond of have then been named women and children and treasures of gold and silver and mark horses and these cattle and plantations. So remember, this is the Arab culture that these were the things that they, were, they, they would hold there. And it was in the love of these things that they would do all sorts of evil things as well. In order to gain these things, they would murder people, they would sacrifice their children and whatnot. So God, this point that is being made here is that remember, these are the people who have been led astray by not actually regarding these favors of God to be entrusted to them for a particular cause. But this has made them arrogant on the contrary. And therefore, now they think that this is all that they should strive for. And therefore, the Quran says, Zalika mataul hayat dunya, that this is just a small provision of this world. And if you look at what God has, Wallahu indahu husnul ma'ab. And then that husnul ma'ab or the best abode is, is, then, is then delineated by the Quran. And it says that this is basically that paradise in which you will, be, you will find that rivers are going to flow uh, beneath those orchards. So remember the word orchard uh, and the word uh, rivers that would, flee, uh, that would flow underneath is often misinterpreted as if people, would, people think that, well, there might be underground rivers in paradise at there because it says that there would be orchards below which streams are flowing. So this is not what the Quran is saying. Again, we have to look at the Arabic uh, language in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very particular context. In the Arabia of those times, the orchards that were imagined to be very, very luring and very, very attractive and something which the Arabs treasured were the ones which, uh, which were placed on a, high, on a higher mountain top. Because now the, the, these winds and these, uh, the flood water would not be able to affect them. So something that would be really attractive to the Arabs were these orchards that would be on a high level or a high, high, higher level than the sea, higher level than all these things could invade them. And as a result, of course, these rivers would flow in the valleys of those mountains. So when it is said that these are orchards beneath which rivers are going to flow, it's not that they're going to flow underneath them, like they have underground water canals. No, what is being said is that they, they, these orchards would be at a much higher level and these rivers would be flowing at a lower level so you could glance at those, uh, at those rivers. And this was, was something which these Arabs really treasured and that is why the Quran is named uh, has described uh, paradise to them in this way. Again, fiha azwajum mutaharatun, they have chest wives. Of course, this is something which everyone would, 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 uh, uh, would relish. And remember when the word is used in the way it has been used here, it refers to the fact that women and men both will be there for each other's pleasures. And of course, the biggest thing would be rizwanu min Allah, which means the, the pleasure of God, that the, he, would be, he would be happy with all of the people who have gathered there. And there, he is the person who knows his servants, he's watching over them. And then these beautiful attributes are mentioned that they are the ones who persevere, they are the ones who speak the truth, they are the ones who are obedient, who are munfiqeen, which means that who are spending for the cause of God. And then most of all, mustaghfirina bil ashar, which means that at, at daybreak, they are the ones who seek for God's forgiveness. Referring in particular to the tahajjud prayer, the night prayer, that these believers are ones who don't get arrogant, who are not in any way, they don't think of themselves, they are not full of themselves. On the other hand, they are down to earth. They always look at their own blemishes and their own faults. And at daybreak, which is the time when, uh, when people are mostly sleeping, they, they are awake at that time and they ask for God's forgiveness. Mustaghfirina bil ashar. These are the people God says that would be chosen for his final destination. So I'm going to stop here, not going to go beyond that. If you have any questions regarding what we have studied so far, we'll take them and also in the absence of these questions or after these questions, we can also take some general ones. Shiraz Ahmed, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Sister. <clears throat> Shiraz I have a question related to Rupa Mukatat, And I already okay. know the Fraqis view. My question is that Quran says that it's revealed in Arbi Mubin, and we believe that it's been transferred from generation to generation. Kafa and Kafa is the term, I guess. So, why so many prolific Arabic scholars and Quranic commentators in the past ended up saying that only God knows what these disjointed letter means? Now, the only thing I will add is the 
for me, it's different than other theological disputes because it's not a question of theology. It's a question of pure Arabic grammar, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, so why they couldn't mm -hmm. come to the right conclusion regarding the simple meaning or just the connotation of these letters, just like Farahi mm -hmm. school did? That's the, right. question. the question. Okay, so let me just put this thing in perspective. If you look at our source books, you'll find that a very vast majority of our scholars regard them to be the names of the surahs. So there's no dispute. I mean, there is dispute regarding why these surahs are named so, but as far as the fact that Alif Lam Meem or Ham Meem and Sin Qaf, what exactly do they stand for? As far as a very vast majority of scholars are concerned, you can consult them. They regard them to be the names of the surah. So there, I mean, there is little dispute in that. The problem is that why is it that they are named so? It is here that Ustaz Farahi and some of his compatriots have uh, tried to explain the reasoning behind a certain name. I mean, if someone is called Usman or Umar or Abu Bakr, you know that he's named by, I mean, you know the name. But at times, if you don't know the meaning of that name, it doesn't make any difference because you see a name is something which connotes a, an entity. So Imran, Ali Imran, is an, I mean, is, that's a name. So if you don't know the meaning of the word Imran, that would not change or add anything. So the debate is not that people think that they are, uh, that mean they are confusing in, in a way that you don't know what they stand for. The real debate is between the, the hikmah or the wisdom that why is it that they are named so? What is so special about being named in separate letters? So it is here that that contribution has been made. So the reason that you find a vast majority of scholars saying that, well, this is, a, this is something which only God knows, uh, you'll find that because they are stating this, not that they're saying that they don't know what exactly these are. What they're saying is that only God knows why, what are the meanings of these names. And yes, there are other scholars also who think that, uh, I mean, they, they are not names. For example, uh, I know Western scholars who think that these are abbreviated let letters that reflect the names of the scribes of the Quran. Alif Lam Mim is basically a signature of the scribe who wrote that particular surah. And this is found in our own uh, history as well. And similarly, uh, there are other reasons as well. But as I said, if you read the sources, you'll find that a very vast majority regards them to be the names of the surahs. But the question is that why are they named so? Thank you for that, Dr. Salim. Noshaba, please unmute your mic. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you just describe the sabr uh, definition? In uh, describe the what? Sabr, the patient. The patient. Uh, a sabirin. You see the word a sabirin in the Arabic language, the word sabir refers, uh, I mean, a, a more accurate translation uh, of the word sabr in the Arabic language is perseverance, is steadfastness. So you see, uh, when you look at its uh, Urdu connotation, because this word is uh, used in the Urdu language as well, normally in Urdu when we uh, look at the word sabr, it means that you have nothing else to do but be patient and accept what has happened. This is not this Arabic connotation. In Arabic, the word sabr means to stare the adversity in its eye, to stare the problem in its eye, to not give up, to face that challenge, to persevere against uh, any such odds that might come your way. So basically, it's a positive attribute in which you have that steadfastness, you have that energy, you have that zeal and valor to, uh, to, uh, to face any challenge that might come in front of you. So just to expand on this, then Dr. Salim, does the sabr that sabr and shukar mm -hmm. that the Quran talks about, is that the Arab sabr and shukar or the one that we, the concept we have in Urdu? I mean, that is uh, something that we have to know that the Quran has been revealed in Arabic, not in Urdu. So we must translate the word the way it is understood in Arabic. And that is why, I mean, I generally translate this word to be those who persevere. Only in certain exceptional cases, I do translate it as patient. Because in that particular case, uh, because the word patience also has this uh, element of steadfastness in it. But uh, on occasions when I need to explain this word, uh, to an audience maybe or maybe uh, in the text of the Quran, I would always go for this better choice which is perseverance because perseverance gives you this ring of being patient and at the same time uh, being resilient and bold in facing any adversity. Whereas the Urdu concept of sabr is 
that you are just, I mean, you just accept what has happened and you just have no other choice but to remain patient. So this, this has a different ring to it. Okay. So, Dr. Salim, I have a question. Um, in the past, we've talked about uh, a lot about, uh, I think, in reference to the Quran, where Muslims were told, are told currently that don't ask too many questions. And you have explained that. Can you just kind of throw light on that again? Where is it in the Quran that God uh, has said that um, has addressed the either the idolaters or so this is this you'll find this uh, I think it's in Surah Anam uh, or in Surah Maida one of the two surahs you just you can just check so basically what is being said in, in, in that at that in that instance is that you I mean because the Jews were uh, very fond of asking questions and going into details especially the nitty gritties and they would uh, do this hair splitting. Uh, that they are told, well, if you ask these irre irrelevant questions that you are, you are you're normally used to, then the answer that God is going to give you is going to tighten your screws because the answer would be such that it will be such a pinpointed answer that the latitude that you originally had would no longer be there. So basically, it is referring to unrelated questions, questions which were generally meant to, remain, to, to be at your discretion, I mean, the certain things which, were God, which God said in general and he did not want to, de to de determine exactly pinpoint what he meant. He gave you a broad question uh, or a broad concept and he wanted it to remain broad so that there could be different opinions. But when you started to pinpoint it, so this, uh, this verse which the Quran says, I don't ask questions, is not referring to any genuine questions that people might have because this is what the Quran encourages. It's referring to these nitty gritties, these questions which is going to tighten your own uh, sphere of application. So how did the Muslims come to interpret it for themselves? Because that's what we're told a lot in the subcontinent, don't ask questions. Is there some reference to it? I think this is not the Quran which to say so. This is this, that general mentality in which the Quran, about the Quran, we say that we think that it says, you just believe it what it says. You, you have faith in, you have blind faith. So this Iman Bil Ghaib, this is the root cause of this, uh, uh, I mean, this blind faith. Uh, of course, the verse does not mean in any way that you should have blind faith, but it came to be interpreted as if you should just accept what has been said and not ask any questions. So that may, uh... 15 years ago, uh, one of the uh, adverse uh, critic of Islam, uh, I heard this question from him, so it's not coming from me. So if disjointed letters are the name of the surahs, then let's take example of Surah Bakra and Surah Al Imran. Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Mim, right? The same mm -hmm. letters, uh, the surah begin with the same letters. So if I say that it means the name of the surah, and if I tell Shizad Bhai, I read Surah Alif Lam Mim, you won't know whether I'm talking about Surah Bakra or Surah Al Imran because they are not unique to each Surah, right? Uh, multiple Surah have the same disjointed letter. Doesn't mm -hmm. that kind of dispute uh, uh, with the claim that these are names to the Surahs because they are not unique to each Surah? No, actually, this does not because you see, uh, as far as the way they are mentioned is uh, Hazi, I mean, the word Hazi Alif Lamim is suppressed. And other than that, the, this commonality, remember when they would be referring to surahs which have the same name, for example, the Hawam Meem, there are six surahs which are named by Ham Meem, by the, these two letters. So they would always add one more letter to it in order to distinguish. So they would say, for example, Alif Lam Meem Al Bakara or Alif Lam Meem Al Imran. So they would add one distinguishing letter. And the reason that this there would be such similarity, if you study these surahs deeply, is because of the similarity in theme. I mean, uh, I gave you this example uh, a little while ago that Arabs, they, were, they would name their own progeny with the same name. For example, Abdullah Abdul Rahman is something that they would have the same. I mean, they would have five sons and all of them would be, would be named as Abdul Rahman. But there would be one additional letter like Abdul Rahman the first or maybe Abdul Rahman Ahmad or Abdul Rahman Hamid that would distinguish uh, that first name from the other. So this was quite customary uh, in, the, in the Arab scenario. So when this distinguishing uh, feature would be needed, they would add one more letter, like as I said, Alif Lam Mim Al Bakara or Alif Lam Mim Al Imran, or if, as I said, any earlier uh, on in the times of uh, the Prophet and his companions, this debate was not even there because this was a much later debate. In the times, maybe on the first hundred years, uh, when these names were, I mean, not being, I mean, they were not the new names were not being so common. Uh, as I said, the whole sentence was sp spoken. Asura Alati Tuskaru Fihil Bakara, Asura Alati Tuskaru Al Imran, Asura in which 
Al Imran or the progeny of Imran is mentioned. So the whole sentence would be uh, referred to while uh, referring to that surah. It was only much later that this Thank sentence got shortened. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Saleem. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for a fantastic session and we will see everyone next week.